in Psalms uh, chapter 34, verse 8, David, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. David said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Tonight, I want to just touch on the goodness of God. You know, there's, there's so much that is um, happening right now. And, you know, you can look at all of the um, stuff that's taking place and the decisions that men seem to be making and the lives that seem to be um, destroyed. And, it, it, you know, you can look at the news and just kind of get discouraged. But I just want to remind you tonight that God is still in control and he's a good God. I mean, he is a good, good God. And David says something here in the midst of this text. Uh, he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, what does he mean when he says taste and see that the Lord is good? Uh, we can't taste the Lord with our, our, our tongue per se, like we can taste a, a apple or a orange. So what does David really mean when he says taste and see that the Lord is good? Um, the best illustration I can give you is um, last night, uh, my wife, uh, she went and picked up some dinner from a, a restaurant and she came back and she said, well, this place had some, some new chicken, a um, uh, new flavored chicken and it's really good. Um, and she said, um, do you want some? You wanna taste it? And so I said, yeah, let me, let me taste it. And she was saying, well, I don't know if it's gonna be too spicy for you, but you, know, you, you might wanna taste it. And so I said, yes, okay, fine, let me, let me taste it. And so she took a fork and she uh, gave me a piece, stuck a piece in my mouth, and I tasted the chicken, and it was, it was delicious. Now, what David means here, when he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, what David is saying is, in essence, experience the Lord and see that he's good. See, the only way I could know that that new flavored chicken was, was good was for me to taste it. And by tasting it, meaning experience um, uh, that chicken in my mouth with my taste buds. So this is what David is saying when he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. David is saying, have an experience with God and see if he is not good to you. And that's what I wanna talk about tonight. I just want to just walk through some scriptures and just kind of remind you tonight that God is good. And don't forget his goodness. Don't forget about his goodness. Don't get caught up in life and stuff happening in life and everyday routine and the news and what have you and allow that to suck the joy out of you. You just remember that the God that you and I serve, he's a good God. He is an incredible God. He's a wonderful God and he, he is good. But in order for us to know that he's good, we have to experience him for ourselves. Uh, in Psalms 30, verse 5, uh, in the midst of um, this uh, particular writing, David reveals something to us about the goodness of God. The text says in ver uh, Psalms chapter 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. David says four key things here about uh, the goodness of God. He reveals four things about the character of God and his goodness towards us as his children. He says, for his anger endureth but a moment. What David is saying here in essence is that God is so good that he doesn't stay angry with us. God's not like people, you know, people, they get upset with you and uh, they get angry with you and they stay angry uh, uh, for a long time. Some people just stay angry forever. They, they make up in their mind, they just cannot and will not forgive you. But David is saying in essence that God is so good that he doesn't stay angry with us. Over in John chapter two, we know that Jesus, he demonstrated righteous anger when he went into the temple and turned over uh, the money changers, because they were in the temple uh, exchanging money and what have you. And Jesus demonstrated anger, but it was a righteous anger. 
So God will demonstrate a righteous anger towards those who are um, operating in evil and operating in unrighteousness, if you will. But he, his anger doesn't remain, if you will. In Romans chapter one, verse 18, the Living Bible translation, the text says this, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, evil men who push away the truth from, from them. And what the text is saying here is that for those evil men who push away the truth, God shows forth his anger. And so what the text is saying is that God's anger is never misguided. It's never misguided. God only demonstrates his anger towards those who are operating in a sinful way, an evil way, and doing so willfully. But his anger towards us as his children, he doesn't stay angry forever. But then David says this, he says in the same verse, in his favor is life. David is saying not only does God anger does not uh, remain toward, uh, remain and, and does, not only does God not remain angry with us, should I say, uh, his favor towards us is for life. One of the things, man, that you can be assured of if you are a child of God, and that is that the favor of God surrounds you like a shield, is what the text says. You can be sure of one thing, and that is that God's favor rests upon your life if you are a child of God and you are living according to his principles and to his word. But David says his favor is for life. Uh, the psalmist says over in Psalms 119, verse 58, the Amplified Version, the psalmist, he says, I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful and gracious to me according to your promise. The psalmist was saying, I ask for your favor. How many know that we have a right to expect the favor of God? We have a right to ask for the favor of God. We have a right to expect the favor of God to be in operation in our lives as Christians. I don't know about you, but you know, I, I am totally convinced that the favor of God is on my life, it's on my family, and it is in operation in the life of me and my family. And not because I'm special, not because I'm a pastor, but because the scripture says that the favor of the Lord shall surround us like a shield. And if you are a child of God, you have to embrace the fact that the favor of God protects you. It sur surrounds you like a, like, a, like a shield. You got to embrace that and understand that, you know what? I expect the favor of God to be in my life. I expect the favor of God to be an operation in my life. And that has to be your conviction, man. You have to have that conviction that God favors me and uh, make that confession over your life. Now, David says this, he says, weeping may endure for a night. The same verse, when David says weeping may endure for a night, what David is saying that God has boundaries around us. He has boundaries around our difficulties. Man, that's a powerful thing right there. When you think about the goodness of God and when you understand that God has boundaries around us in terms of how much uh, difficulty is allowed to come into our lives, man. That, that, is, that is incredible to even think about that. Job, when you read it over in Job about um, the life of Job, and in, in chapter one, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, Satan is going back and forth through the earth and the Lord says, you know, what are you doing? He said, I'm just running back and forth up and down the earth. And the Lord asked Job a question. He said, have you tried my servant Job? And Satan said, in essence, you know, I, I can't get to Job. He said, you have a hedge built around Job. I can't touch him. He said, but I tell you what, remove that hedge and Job will curse you to your face when I get through with it. And God told him, he says in verse 12 of Job chapter one, in NIV translation, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. I love that, <laughs> I love that. God told Satan, he said now, I'm gonna remove the hedge from around Job. He says, but now there's gonna be boundaries set on you as to what you can and cannot do. And he says, on the man himself, do not lay a finger. In other words, you could touch all of his stuff, but don't you put your hands on Job. What does that tell me? That tells me that God has boundaries around me and around you as to how much difficulty can, can enter into our lives. 
This is the goodness of God, man. This is God's favor upon your life. This is his goodness upon your life. And sometimes we can forget just how protected we are as children of God. The enemy just can't just walk into your life and destroy you or do what he wants to do. If that's the case, he'd destroy all of us. He would destroy everyone who was a Christian because he doesn't want any voices out there that would um, proclaim the goodness of God. So as soon as you became a born again, the enemy would just take you off the earth if he could, but he can't. Why is that? That's because God has established boundaries around our difficulty. This is why you always had to make Romans 8, 28, or remember Romans 8, 28, and make that a part of who you are as a Christian, where you understand that no matter what comes your way, God is going to use it now. He's going to use it for your, for your good. He's going to bring some good out of it. And a lot of times we, we just, it's hard as humans to get a hold of that, of that scripture when he says, I'm going to take the good and bad and work, good, bad, and ugly and work it to your good. It's just hard to really get a hold of that, especially when something tragic happens and it causes so much pain to us. But even in the midst of that, God says, you know what? I know what you can handle. I, I, I know what you're capable of dealing with. And if you were not capable of dealing with it, I would not allow it to come your way. There's bounds you set around you as my child. Then he says this, he says, uh, but the joy cometh in the morning. Uh, what David is saying here, revealing about the goodness of God, is that uh, the joy of God is inescapable. It, it's, it's certain. It's, it's a certain thing for a believer. That's why it's um, discouraging to see a believer who doesn't have joy. There's no way that you can be a believer and, and say you don't have joy. You have joy. You just have not chosen to uh, uh, to operate in joy. You have just have not chosen to embrace joy, but you have joy. He says, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalms 132 verse 9, the text says, let thy priests be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. That scripture right there lets us know that joy is based on a decision of my will. I make a decision. I make a choice to shout for joy, I make a, a, a choice or a decision to wake up in joy, to operate in joy, to live in joy. We have to choose now to enjoy life. You know, yes, Jesus says in this world, you're gonna have some problems, you're gonna have some, um, some trouble, but be a good cheer to overcome the world. Yeah, well, there's gonna be problems, the problems come, it's, it's part of life. But you and I, as born again believers, we can still make a decision to enjoy our lives. And this is one of the blessings of the Lord, to be able to enjoy life. To be able to know that in spite of my, my current condition, whatever it might be, if it's not something that is favorable to me, or if it's a place where I'm not really um, happy to be in at the moment, I, I still rejoice in the God of my salvation because I know that the God that whom I serve is gonna change that situation eventually. And so I make a decision to live a joyful life. We have to make a decision, man, as, as children of God. You know what? I'm not messing up my day over something that I cannot control. I'm not messing up, messing up my day over something that someone has said or what someone's trying to do to me. I'm just not gonna mess up my day over that. Because the reality is, I don't know if I'm gonna get another day tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know if I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I don't know, I, you know, I can make plans of waking up in the morning. I can make plans of having lunch with you tomorrow. I can make plans of uh, attending your function next month. But the reality is, it, I, I really need to be saying that the Lord willing because I really don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what tonight holds. I don't know what uh, next week holds, but I do know this. I can make a decision of my will to enjoy the moment right now. And so many of us, we are losing the benefit of the moment because we're worried about next week. We're worried about this person. We're worried about the bills. I'm not trying to downplay that those things may not be um, of any uh, significance. I'm just simply saying they should not be allowed to put your joy up. Because at the end of the day, 
you know that you serve the almighty God who is able and willing to change your situation when that time comes for it to be changed. You just have to know and embrace the fact that you know what? God is able. <laughs> He's able. And I'm going to keep my focus on him. So David, in this teaching, uh, he reveals these four characters of God. And uh, it's a blessing for us to know that these characters of God can be manifested in our lives if we allow God to be who he wants to be in our lives. But they, what happens is oftentimes is we forget. We forget about the sovereignty of God. We forget about the compassion, and the, the compassion God has towards us. We forget about his grace. We forget about his mercy. We just, we just forget. We get caught up in um, uh, 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 the cares of life and what's happening and what's not happening. And sometimes we just forget that we serve a incredible God who does incredible things. And there's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing he cannot do. There's nothing uh, he cannot uh, uh, handle. There's no person he cannot save. There's no situation he cannot get you out of. There's no bill he cannot pay. There's no sickness he cannot heal. There's no country or no king or no president he cannot put down. He says, I put them down, I raise them up. It, 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 there's no situation on earth that's outside of his sphere of influence. And sometimes because we see what we see, because we hear what we hear, and because we think what we think, we think that that limits God. God is not limited. God is on the throne and he's a good God. He's a merciful God and he shall have the last word and it is his counsel that will stand. That's what the word says. It is God's counsel that will stand. Now, four things happen. I, there's more than four, but I just want to just throw out these four because I think that you might be able to relate to these four. But oftentimes there's four things that happen when we forget about the goodness of God. Now, sometimes we're not conscious of, of these four things, but if you just give us some thought, you, I think you will see what I'm saying. But normally there's four things that happen to us when we forget about the goodness of God. And if you're operating in one of these four, that should be a, a sign to you to, you know, kind of shake yourself and get back to the point that, you know what, God is able, God is good. Don't forget the goodness of our God. But these four things, normally happen. One of them is this, and that is when we forget about the goodness of God, sometimes we have the tendency to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. You know, something good happens in our life. We get a promotion. Um, you know, we, the deal goes through. Um, the door opens. Something happens. We get the house. Uh, you know, we get uh, the job that we have been interviewing for, you know, you inter interview four or five times and you get selected out of 3,000 people. And we have a tendency sometimes to take credit for uh, the good things that are happening in our lives. And that should be a sign to you that, you know what, if you're taking credit for anything good happening in your life, that, that should be a sign that you're forgetting about somebody. <laughs> You're forgetting about the one who made it happen. You're forgetting about the one who has blessed you, the one who has touched the hearts of others to, to be a blessing to you. You're, you're forgetting about the goodness of God. First Corinthians chapter four, verse seven, the text says, what are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great and as though you have accomplished something on your own. This tech is, is saying, you know, everything we have is from God. Every, the, the James says every good and perfect gift comes from, from God, it comes from above. And so whatever good is happening to your life, 
in your life tonight, that's good, that's wonderful, I'm happy for you, but be careful now, don't take credit for it. And if you start taking credit for what's happening good in your life, that's an indication that you're forgetting about the goodness of God. Even those who are making uh, these large salaries now, you can say, I, I went to school and I, I did all the training and I, I did all the networking and I, I built up my resume and I, I did this. When the Bible makes it very clear in Deuteronomy 8, that it is God who gives us the power to get wealth. If God did not give us the power or give you the power to get wealth, you wouldn't have it. And oftentimes we forget that. We forget about the goodness of God. And so just remember, you know, especially if you're uh, allowing yourself to be down on one area of your life, you know, something uh, can be going wrong in one area of your life or something may not be going according to plan in one area of your life and you allow that one particular thing to just consume you and take your joy and take your peace and you forget about all this other stuff in your life that's going right, that is going according to plan and you put your focus on this one thing, what you're doing is you're forgetting about what God has done over here the goodness of God over here, the blessings of God over here, and you've all focused on this negative thing over here. And so when you do that, what you're saying is, I'm, I'm taking credit for this over here. I want God, I want you to deal, for, deal with this over here. When you really should be, be praising God over here for everything he's done over here. All this good stuff going on and saying, God, I thank you that you're gonna take care of that as well. Don't forget about the goodness of God when it comes to God blessing you. You know, over in Luke chapter 12, it talks about the rich man and how the rich man, he, you know, he had all this plenty, uh, 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 this abundance, should I say. He had plenty, had abundance. And uh, he told himself, well, I'm gonna build more barns and stick all this stuff in uh, these barns that I build because I got so much stuff. And the text says, God called him a fool. And he says, you know, your food. He said, food, this night your soul is going to be required of you. And then who's all this stuff going to belong? You know, we forget, man, that God has blessed us and we get caught up in uh, what he's done and taking credit for what he's done. And then not realizing that God has the ability to move, remove you from the earth just like that, like a vapor. Don't get caught up in taking credit for what God has done. If God has blessed you, He's blessed you. Don't apologize for it, but don't take credit for it neither. Recognize that whatever good is going on in your life tonight, God's done it. But you also have to recognize that when you are not giving God the credit and giving him the glory that's due unto his name, then that's an indication that you really have allowed yourself to forget just who God is in your life. The second thing that happens that we need to acknowledge tonight when it comes to forgetting about the, the goodness of God is, you know, you can tell when you forgot about how good God is when you stop asking God for his assistance, when you stop asking God for, for wisdom to make right choices, when you stop looking towards God to help you in your marital situation, in your job situation, in your financial situation, when you stop going to God and asking God for his assistance, that's the indication that you have forgotten about who God really is in your life and about his goodness. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, the text says, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so what that text is saying is that God knows how to bless us. He knows how to uh, answer uh, our, our questions. He knows how to deal with our situations. And so don't allow yourself to stop seeking the face of God. Stop, answer, stop asking God for his assistance. Anytime you get to that place where you feel that, you know, you don't need to pray anymore about a situation, you don't need God to help you anymore about your, your situation, that's an indication that you have really forgotten <laughs> God's position in your life. James chapter one, verse five, New Living Translation of Texas, says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. James says, if you need wisdom, ask God. 
when you stop asking for guidance, when you stop asking for God's assistance, when you stop crying out to God and saying, Lord, I need wisdom. I need to understand what it is you would have me do in this situation. When you stop seeking the advice of God, that's an indication that you really have forgotten just how good he is in your life. And you have forgotten his position in your life. James says, if you need wisdom, ask for wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, a very simple definition of wisdom is the ability to make right decisions at the right time that will produce now righteous living. Let me say it again. Wisdom is the ability to make right decisions at the right time whereby producing righteous living. You know, how much better would a lot of us be tonight if we could just make the right decisions or had we made better decisions? Wisdom is really just getting insight from the heart of God. And oftentimes when we stop asking God for his assistance, we are forgetting that God is all knowing, all knowing, all knowledgeable. He has the answers. But see, sometimes we think we're smarter than God. Sometimes we think that, you know what, we could figure this out on our, on our own. And we forget that we're in the mess that we're in because we didn't acknowledge God or we didn't go to God before we made our decisions. And so we make choices, we get into the mess that we're in, and then we're gonna make more decisions trying to get out of the mess that we got ourselves into without seeking the face of God. See, wisdom is the, the measure by which a, a, a person uh, does things. See, let me put it like this. You can measure a person's wisdom based on their behavior. You can identify a person's wisdom based on their decision making. It's like this. You can look at a tree and you can look at the fruit of the tree and based on the fruit of the tree, you can determine what type of tree that fruit came from. I mean, if I have an apple, then I know that's an apple tree. If I have a, a, a grape, then I know that these grapes came from a grapevine. It's the same thing with uh, an individual. You can look at their, 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 their choices and you can determine whether or not those, uh, those choices were tied to godly wisdom. You can identify a person's wisdom based on their, their actions. You can evaluate someone's actions look at those actions and determine whether or not those actions were based on wisdom. It's the same thing when it comes to identifying fruit that comes from a tree. And I'm just simply saying that for us as God's children, if we don't forget his goodness and remember that he's there, he's available to us, all we have to do is continue to ask for his assistance, ask for his wisdom, ask for his help, ask for him to intervene, ask for him to help in the marriage, have him, ask him to help in the finances. Don't, you know, don't, don't continue to think that you can make decisions on your own and you can work it out and it's going to get better. When in reality, you're in the mess that you're in because you didn't seek the face of God. God wants to help us. He says, James says, just ask. And he'll help us. And then the third thing is this, that David reveals uh, in this verse about the character of God when it comes to his goodness. And that is, you know, oftentimes we can tell that we are um, um, uh, not acknowledging the goodness of God or we have forgot about the goodness of God when we stop trusting him. Especially when our backs are against the wall. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll go along and we say we trust God and I, I believe God and God's gonna do it. God is, he's able and he is, he, he can do all things and, and yeah, I believe God. But then when our backs get against the wall, whereby we really have to trust God, that's when we start trying to figure out things on our own and we stop trusting God. Sometimes you can talk to someone who uh, in, is in a tight situation and you say, well, come on, let's, let's, let's pray. Let's, let's pray about this situation. Let's, let's go to God, let's pray, and let's believe God to move in this situation. And 
you know, sometimes they'd be like, you know, I done prayed. I'm tired of praying. Now let's go to the word. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't went to the word. I, you know, I don't need, don't get religious with me right now. I need, I need, I need something to happen. That's when you know that this person, this individual has forgotten the goodness of God. They, they have forgot about God's position in their life and who he is because they stopped trusting him because things have gotten really difficult. See, that's when you, this is how you know when you really trust God. When God is the first person you go to, when your back is against the wall, that's when you know that you really trust God. The Bible says this in Psalms 40, verse four. It says, blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. The message translation reads like this. It says, of Psalms 40, verse four, it says, blessed are you who give yourselves over to God, turn your backs on the world's sure thing, ignore what the world worships. This is a good uh, uh, translation of that verse. He says, blessed are you who turn yourselves over to God and you turn your backs on the world's sure thing. See, when you turn your back towards God, you start believing in your money, you start believing in your education, you start believing in your human ability, that's an indication that you have really forgotten who God is. This text says you're blessed when you understand who God is in essence and when you turn your back against what the world says is sure. Now, what does the world say is sure? Well, you operating out there in the, uh, in the realm of the world, then what you're gonna say is, well, if I had more money, I'd be okay. If I had the government backing me, I'd be okay. If I had a better job, I'd be okay. If I had uh, uh, education, I'd be okay. If I, had, if I only had more, one more degree, I'd be okay. If I only had uh, this person helping me, I'd be okay. What you're really saying is, if I just had all these other things that the world depends on, I'd be okay. But this text says you're blessed when you recognize that God is the one that you need and you don't trust in what the world trusts in. And you can tell when a person has forgotten the goodness of God and the blessings of God when they turn their back away from God and they put their trust in what the world trusts in. As God's children, man, we can't trust in finances, we can't trust in uh, human ability, we can't trust in our education. We gotta put our trust in the living God. The text says some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I, I trust in the name of the Lord our God. We're gonna have to trust in God. We're gonna have to believe in God. We're gonna have to know that his word is true, that his promises are sure, and that we have the faith to stand on what he says is to be true in our lives. But now watch this, when you come to that place where you're in, in trouble and you can't trust God, that's an indication now that you have forgotten just how good God is. You have forgotten that God is able to do what you need him to do. It's amazing to me how people will come to church and say God is good and they'll shout, they'll scream and they'll tell other people about the goodness of God only when that backs get against the wall, then they start singing another story. Well, I need for this to happen. I need for that to happen. And to call this person, let's do this, let's do that. Well, no, I tell you what, let's pray. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Let's see what the scripture has to say about that. Oh no, I, you know, I don't know that. I need something to happen. I, need, I, you know, I, I don't need that spiritual stuff right now. No, that's an indication that you really don't believe that God is as good as he said he is. You really don't believe that he's able to bless you. Now, Psalm 16, verse eight, the text says this in the message translation. It says, day and night, I stick with God. I got a good thing going and I'm not letting go. <laughs> I love this, this, this translation of Psalm 16. He says, day and night, I'm gonna stick with God. I got a good thing going and I'm not, I'm not letting it go. That's where you gotta get a revelation. You gotta understand that, you know what? Night and day, day and night, I'm sticking with God. 
God's a good thing. He's a sure thing. And I'm not letting it go. I'm not letting God go. I'm not letting the relationship go. I'm not letting my covenant with God go. This is a good thing going and I'm not letting it go for anybody. Amen, somebody. There's Psalm 16, verse one, and verse two, the NIV translation, the text says, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. The psalmist was saying, keep me safe. I take you in, I, I trust in you, you as my refuge. He says, you are my Lord, apart from you, I have no good thing. The psalmist made it very clear, God is my refuge. And that's, you know, that's when you know that, you know what, you are uh, remembering the blessings of God, you remember God's ability and his, uh, his position in your life when you understand that, you know what, God is my refuge, and I stick with him. 24 seven, I'm staying with God. I know what they're saying, I, I'm staying with God. I, I know what I see, but I'm staying with God. I know what I may be thinking, uh, what the enemy's trying to put in my thought process, but you know what, I'm staying with God. Why am I doing that? Because God is my refuge. I got a good thing going, I'm not gonna let it go. He's a good God. He's, he, he's the blesser, and I'm not gonna let him go. And then this last thing is this. This last thing, when you Stop believing that God is able to do what he said he can do in your life. When you forget about him being a, a, a blessing to you and a blessing in your life, you get pessimistic. You get, um, you lose hope in your situation. You lose hope about the possibilities of what can happen uh, in your situation. And this is what happens oftentimes in, 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 in the lives of individuals who um, who give their, um, let me put it like this, when, when they get married, you know, they're, they're happy, they're on fire, they're believing uh, the best, um, they, they take their vows, and then, of course, you know, life happens. You know, people, they change in terms of, they, in their growth, in their understanding of, of life itself. You know, people get married at a young age and 18, 19, 20, they didn't expect this person they married at 18 to be the same person they married when they're 39. And that's just not the reality. People are growing, people are changing, people are experiencing different things. Stuff happens in life. But, you know, because things are not the way they, they were when you first got married or the way you thought they would be, you just give up, you walk away, you get pessimistic. There's no hope for this. This is never gonna work. No, no, what you're saying is, I'm forgetting about how good God is to me and my, my wife, or to me and my husband, and to me and my family, and what he's able to do. You've, you've allowed yourself to just forget about uh, what God is able to do. And so you get pessimistic, you, you get doubtful, you, you get um, uh, uh, bitter. Why? Because you forget about how good God really is. The Bible says in Psalms 27, verse 13 through verse 14, I'm reading out the New Living Translation. The text says, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. This is David. David said, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, wait patiently for the Lord be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. David said, I, I'm confident. I may not be confident about a lot of things, but he said, I'm confident about this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord on this side, of this side of heaven, in the land of the living. David said, I know, I'm confident, I know that I'm gonna see God bless me, be good to me right now. I'm not waiting to get to heaven. No, I, I'm gonna see God bless me right now. And when you cannot as a Christian envision God blessing you right now on this side of heaven, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your finances, whether it's your physical health, whether it's your relationship with your children, whether it's your career, whether it's your ministry, whether it's your business, if you cannot envision God blessing you 
on this side of heaven, you have allowed yourself to forget the goodness of God. You have forgotten just how good God really is. David said, I'm confident that I'll see God bless me. I don't have to wait to get to heaven. I am confident that I will see the Lord bless me, that he will bless me in the land of the living. I know he's gonna bless me. He says, so I'm gonna wait patiently for him. And he's encouraging us, wait patiently for him. <laughs> don't give up on him, don't quit on him, don't come up with your own solutions, don't listen to what other people have to say about how to handle your situation. Don't go outside of scripture. Don't go outside of the text. Don't go outside of the covenant of God. Don't, don't allow your, your human understanding of things to interfere with God's divine plan for your life. Remember his goodness. Remember that he's able. Remember his position in your life as God, as the all sovereign God. Remember that now. And, you know, I, I'm just kind of walking through these scriptures tonight because I just want to encourage you to remember the goodness of God in your life, in his position in your life as a Christian. Don't forget who you serve. Don't forget who's Lord over your life. We're not just talking about a president who's voted in and out of office every four years. We're talking about God, the creator of the universe. <laughs> We're talking about one who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask to think according to the power that working within us. What is that power? That is his presence residing within us. Don't forget about the goodness of God. In Psalms 100 verse five, I'm gonna close on this. The psalmist says, for the Lord is always good. He is always loving and kind and his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. Man, that's good. That is so good. He's always good. And his faithfulness goes on from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. This is why David had that revelation, that great revelation. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. David was saying, I invite you to experience <laughs> the God that I serve. And you tell me after you experience him for yourself, if he's not a good God. You tell me after you experience him for yourself, that he's not a gracious God. I'm telling you tonight, we serve an incredible God. Don't allow yourself to forget about goodness of Jehovah. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Don't worry about what man is doing or not doing. Just remember that the God that you and I serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Doug Thompson, and you, is still on the throne, and he's a good God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity just to share in your word just to remind ourselves about your goodness, <laughs> about your faithfulness. Oh God, you're incredible. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your love, your compassion that are brand new every morning. God, you're incredible. And Lord, we just wanna say thank you for what you are doing and that you love, that we love you tonight, Lord, and that we are just appreciative of our covenant with you. Lord, we pray that you will continue, Lord, to, to bless your people, that you will continue to lead and guide and direct us, and that you will continue, Father, to give us understanding of your promises, of your covenant that we made with you. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. And again, don't forget about the goodness of God. Remember, we serve a good God. Amen. What a wonderful message we just heard. Praise God for our pastor. It's offering time and I want to encourage you to give as unto the Lord. We have a scripture I want to read for you, your encouragement. And it's in the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter, beginning around about the 13th verse. And this is Paul as he was talking to the Philippians. He said, I can do all things 
through Christ which strengthened me. Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate it with my afflictions. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again under my necessity. Not because I desire gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received a reproditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. And he goes on to say, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. I just want to thank you for uh, that. You know, Paul was sharing with us that after we give, he, after he encouraged the Philippians to give, and, and he mentioned to them that this was going to go on their account. He used an accounting term. Uh, you know, that's a term we're familiar with as we go back and forth to our bank. And a lot of times we, I, I, I don't know about you, but myself, I've, uh, 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 over the time, over time, I uh, had a few checks that would come back insufficient funds because I didn't deposit anything in my account, or my deposit got in late before my check got to the bank, and so it was sent back insufficient funds. Well, Paul is saying for us as Christians and those who uh, want God to put some on our account, it is we got to give, and Paul was encouraging the Philippians. When you give, God is going to put some on your account. And then he goes on to let them know, my God will supply all your needs according not to what you put in your account, but according to his riches in glory. So I want to encourage you to give as unto the Lord, not just say, I'm going to send this church an offering, I'm going to send them my tithe, but know that when you send your offering or you send your tithe, you are given into a system that God has put in place to be able to bless you. God wants to bless you, but this is the method that God has given us, that if we sow, we shall reap. And you know that. You, you, uh, a lot of times you say this just in your normal speaking, what goes around comes around. If you give out, it's going to come back to you. Well, that's what Paul is saying. When you give unto the house of God, when you give toward the work of the ministry, God is going to give it back. But he's not going to give it back according to what's in your account. He's going to give it back according to what's in heaven's bank account. So I want to give you a few minutes to get your, your, your offering together and, and get your seed together, whether you're paying tithes or whether you're giving an offering. All is welcome by the house of God. And I know my God will bless you. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to, there to get your offering in hand. And I want to ask you just to raise that seed up before God. And I'm going to pray and ask God to bless your seed. Father God, you see all of our viewing audience with their seed raised up. And we thank you, Father, for their heartfelt desire to give unto the kingdom of God. We ask that your blessing be upon that giving. We rebuke that spirit of lack. We rebuke that enemy that would come and try to uh, 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 come against their finances. And we ask that you meet that need. Uh, if they have in financial hardship, Father, we ask that you would bless them and meet that need, not according to what they see in the bank or according to what they have saved up, but according to what you said to the Philippians, according to your riches in glory. We ask you to bless their seed. Give them a hundredfold return on their giving. In Jesus' name we pray. And God bless you, my friend, and thank you for giving. And Tune in next time to Harvest Rains Ministry. God bless you.